While teaching the subject of the Holocaust must revolve around the historical narrative, we should teach the Holocaust as a human story as well. Who were the six million victims? If we can bring the Holocaust down from that unfathomable number to the story of a single individual and another and another and give them back their faces and their names, then we create empathy, which allows students to understand that the Holocaust happened to real people. Discussing sports is a great way to do this. Before World War II, Jews were very involved in sports as professional athletes, as amateurs, and as spectators. Just as athletes are cultural heroes today, they were back then, too. Even people who don't watch every game or follow local sports will still be aware of international championships and star athletes. Using sports makes the point that the Holocaust happened in the modern world, a world where there were sports teams, stars, and cheering crowds. Sports bridge the gulf between the Holocaust as history and the Holocaust as a human story. At their purest, sports are supposed to transcend politics and race to represent a universal brotherhood of man. The Olympics were created to foster goodwill among nations. The Olympic flag, five interlocking rings, represents this ideal untainted by divergent political beliefs. The people of the world are connected just as the rings are connected in the spirit of peace. In 1936, the Olympics took place in Berlin. Hitler had come to power three years earlier. He had already transformed Germany, taking total control and setting up the first concentration camps. Jews had been thrown out of certain professions, their businesses boycotted, and their citizenship taken away. Germany was already rearming, planning and preparing for a future war. But for two weeks that summer, the Nazi regime manipulated the Olympics in a cynical but dazzling show to sell a different image of Nazi Germany to the international community and to convince the world that Germany was a proud and peaceful country. Margareta Gretel Bergman was an outstanding German athlete whose focus was the high jump. At 16, she broke the German record. Two years later, Hitler and the Nazis came to power, and her athletic career was devastated just because she was Jewish. It started in 1933, really. But I had very good friends of whom I knew that they were members of the Nazi party since 1928. And she was one of my best friends. She didn't care that I was Jewish, and I didn't care that she was a Nazi. She was one of my sports friends, and we got along very well. But then, of course, in 1933, everything changed. Like, overnight, you were not allowed in any public place anymore. And the, the people that you knew wouldn't talk to you anymore. Not because they hated us all of a sudden, but they were all afraid because that was, that was the way it was. You talk to a Jew and you'll be punished. In the spring of 1933, I had belonged to this sports club for since I started to go to Ulm to school and um, had won many medals for them. And when they, uh, uh, in 1933, I got a letter. You're no longer welcome here because you're Jewish. Sincerely yours. <laughs> that was it. That was the end of my sports career in, in Germany. Nazi ideology saw history as a racial struggle between the Germans, the master race, and the Jews, who they condemned as subhuman, a kind of anti-race that threatened not only the German race, but all of humanity. The Nazis believed that the world's fate rested upon the outcome of the struggle against the Jews. Their first policies inside Germany aimed at marginalizing and segregating Jews. They shut Jews out of certain careers. They chased Jews out of public places, like beaches and parks. Later, they stripped Jews of their citizenship. The Nazis used violence and economic pressure to force Jews to leave Germany. Gretel Bergman was only 18 when she felt these abrupt changes. The Nazis threw her out of her sports association, together with thousands of other Jewish athletes. My parents and I decided that I should go to England and see if I could find a school there. And uh, they had a uh, 
a track and field club in the school and uh, when I was shown around in the uh, in the school they took me down to the gym and they were practicing high jumping I mean of all things that was my specialty and uh, my eyes started to bug out and the principal said to me would you like to to do this and I said I would love it so they found an old gym suit for me and I had to jump barefoot nobody could fit my big feet you know <laughs> and that was the first time I had done this in so long and I, I it was just it was heavenly you know <laughs> and I don't think I ever jumped that that well because I was just so relieved that I was into this again she became the British high jump champion in 1934 my father had come to watch me I thought when we got to the hotel, he, uh, he told me that um, the Germans had approached him, that I had to come back to Germany to be on the uh, German Olympic team. And I said, why should I go back? I don't want to go back. And my father said, look, I don't force you into anything, but we were threatened. The family, still living in Germany, of course, uh, we were threatened that if you don't come back, you have to you know, the consequences, they can't guarantee what's going to happen. So, of course, I went back. Meanwhile, Germany was preparing to host the 1936 Olympic Games. The world was aware of the mistreatment of Jews in Germany, and many countries threatened to boycott the Games. Under intense international pressure, Germany guaranteed that its Jews would be permitted to participate in the Olympics. In an elaborate fraud to forestall the boycott, the Nazis pretended that Gretel Bergman would compete even though she was Jewish. Gretel was intimidated and forced to return to Germany and train for the Olympics, though she was not even allowed to train in the same stadium as the non-Jewish athletes. Gretel was outraged. She was driven to show what a Jewish athlete could accomplish. She tied the German high jump record one month before the opening ceremony of the Olympics. But it didn't matter how brilliant she was. As soon as the boycott proposal in the U.S. was voted down and the U.S. Olympic team boarded the ship for Germany, the Nazis unceremoniously kicked Gretel off the German team. Two weeks later, they expunged her records from the record books as though she had never existed. Every night I was thinking, what would happen to me if I do compete? And do I have to stand up on that podium and say Heil Hitler like all the others? It was, uh, it was a terrible time for me. I mean, psychologically, it was very, very rough on me. So when the whole thing was over, in a way, I was very upset. In another way, I was enormously relieved. All of a sudden, I didn't have to worry anymore about these things. Gretel could have won the gold medal for Germany. The winning jump was the same height Gretel had jumped a month earlier, but it didn't matter. As a Jew in Germany, Gretel was humiliated and ostracized. With no future in Germany, Gretel emigrated to the United States. She won the U.S. championship in 1937 and 38. She married and raised a family. I, I just packed my gear to go to another championship, and a word came over the radio that the war had started in Europe. And I said, there are more important things in this world than high jumping, and I quit right then and there. I didn't go, and that was the end of my career. Gretel's story shows the effect of the Nazis' racist laws on one Jewish teenager in Germany. Many other German Jews who suffered from the same racist policies were either forced to leave Germany or managed to leave in the years before World War II. The story of Gretel Bergman also raises many questions. What is the power of ideology and racism? What was the attitude of the Germans towards the suffering of their Jewish neighbors? We could focus, for instance, on Bergman's fellow German athletes how did they treat her? Why did nations take part in the 1936 Olympics even though they were held by a dictatorship abusive to its citizens? What were the consequences of the indifference of the world's nations towards injustice? <laughs> 